Welcome to part two of the course where we start talking about the cognitive phenomena we'll be simulating to provide a firm foundation for what follows. We're going to talk about the large scale organization of the brain and everything we've talked about so far has been more focused on the kind of microstructure, the detailed architecture of the cortex in particular, how individual neurons connect, how they interact, but we haven't really touched on kind of the, the large scale macroscopic picture of how different brain areas might be specialized for performing different cognitive functions and how they might interact in supporting those functions. So that's really what we talk about in this chapter, uh, extending some of the principles that we developed in the first part to think about how these different brain areas might be organized. And that again provides the foundation for what we do with for the rest of the uh, remainder of the course. So we're going to do a quick whirlwind tour on the gross anatomy of the brain. It's a nice pun. I always get grossed out by anatomy and have actually held a lot, not a life, actually held a real human brain in my hands, which is just a mind-blowing experience if you ever get that opportunity in a good way. Uh, I recommend doing it. And um, yeah, it's just astounding you're holding everything right there and uh, I'm not medical school material so yeah that's really scary for me I'm easily very queasy the parts of the brain we've been talking about so far are really the cerebral cortex then otherwise known as the neocortex this is where most of cognitive function at least the more detailed aspects of it takes place Interconnected with the cerebral cortex is the thalamus, also sometimes known as the gateway to the cortex. But as we just looked at in the error-driven learning section in the last chapter, it could also play a critical role in supporting uh, how the cortex learns. And it's densely interconnected with the cortex at every aspect throughout the entire cortical area. Uh, only a part of what it does is convey sensory signals from the outside world into the cortex. And so uh, it plays a really important role also in alertness, arousal, uh, very important roles overall in regulating and interacting with the cortex. It's also widely thought to play an important role in attention. The thalamus also is directly interconnected with the basal ganglia, and these are a set of nuclei that uh, interact with and receive from the frontal cortex and then send projections via the thalamus back up to the frontal cortex. So one way to think about it is that the basal ganglia is kind of an extra add-on for the frontal interconnectivity of the thalamus, missing uh, in the interconnectivity with the posterior cortex, but there for the frontal cortex, and the frontal cortex we'll see in a moment is really important for deciding which actions to perform, and the basal ganglia seems to be specialized for helping make those kinds of decisions. It's sort of a decision-making part of your brain. There's the cingulate gyrus, which is also really just essentially a part of the regular cortex, although you can distinguish it anatomically. And underneath the thalamus is the hypothalamus, um, and it actually has nothing to do with the thalamus per se. It's very much important for uh, secreting hormones and regulating overall body function at a very kind of core level. This is essentially the BIOS of your brain, if you know that term from computers. The basic input-output operating system, it's very, very core kind of for keeping you awake, allowing you to go to sleep if you can. It regulates your uh, fight or flight responses, all these kind of really core aspects, survival related aspects of, of the body are involve uh, the hypothalamus. The amygdala right nearby here is also really important for core uh, bodily function, but more at the level of threat detection and threat recognition, also opportunity recognition. A lot of people think of it as just a fear kind of area, but it also is important for recognizing opportunities and positive potential outcomes. And it essentially uh, is part of the classic medial limbic system that's often described from uh, early work trying to understand the functions of the brain. And these are kind of this collection of medial 
midline based brain areas that are important for affect, motivation, arousal, those kinds of functions. Uh, the hippocampus is actually anatomically right next door to the amygdala uh, and it, as everybody probably knows, is critical for episodic memory, for encoding uh, new memories of the world as you're experiencing them. If you look at the proportion of the size of the hippocampus relative to the cortex, it's tiny in comparison and yet somehow all of our memories that we normally think of when we think of memory that kind of you know what did i have for dinner last night who who am i uh what do i know all these kinds of things uh these kinds of explicit people call it declarative memory things you can uh, can really kind of consciously access those memories are really dependent in in large part on the hippocampus the cortex it's thought is more encoding semantic memory and more implicit kinds of memory. We'll get into these distinctions in the memory chapter, of course. The hippocampus anatomically is a form of archae cortex or primordial cortex. It's present in uh, reptiles and certainly very large in rodents, a representative of the first cortical area. And then neocortex is the newer kind of cortex that built up on that same model. Tucked in underneath the back of your brain is the cerebellum, which interestingly comprises about half of the neurons in your brain and is really important for fine motor control. Uh, it's somewhat surprising that if you don't happen to have your cerebellum after you become an adult through stroke or injury, you actually do pretty well. And so even though it's half the neurons, um, it has relatively minor effects after you've already learned to do fine motor control. And this is a clue that it may be teaching the cortex how to do this fine motor control. And as we met, briefly mentioned in the learning chapter, uh, it may be playing a role of a forward model or predictive learner to learn when you're gonna make a mistake and anticipate those mistakes and correct them before they happen. It may also be important for, for timing uh, it's actually a very important new area is looking at all the cognitive functions supported by the cerebellum. Then in the brainstem, we have these really low level kind of spinal motor areas, the pons, the medulla oblongata, easily a top candidate for the most colorful name of something in the brain. Um, and these are really important for basic uh, lower level motor, respiratory, those kinds of functions. Also inside here are very important midbrain neuromodulatory systems, including the ventral tegmental area and the locus cerealis, and the substantia nigra, all these interesting names. And these are where dopamine and serotonin, that's the, in the dorsal raphe, uh, and uh, acetylcholine, these uh, neuromodulators spread uh, far and wide up into the cortex and other brain areas and provide a very important overall regulatory or modulatory role, uh, often reflecting things like, you know, state of arousal, emotional states, um, and we'll talk a lot about these when we talk about the reinforcement learning functions of the brain in chapter seven. It's a reasonably small set of key uh, parts there that you need to know about. We don't go into a lot of anatomical detail on any of these things, so this gives you enough of a toolkit we think, to really understand the core aspects of cognition.